Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. As I promised you, we're going to have a few clips from 2016. Because apparently we had a music contest or something going on. So half the class had a class, the other half didn't. We missed so many classes that recorded it so that the other class could watch the uh, video. So we got about four or five times we'll clip to that. Uh, if I do say, okay, this is the answer for number whatever, that has changed, so I'll put, I'll, I'll superimpose the correct number. So we'll be going back and forth. But anyway, this is called Note Worksheet 3 over Hitler. Note Worksheet 3 over Hitler. Oh. When you give it, uh, when you send it in, it's just called your name and then put N3. N3, that's all you got to put. <laughs> N3, I know exactly yeah. what it's for. Okay, without any further ado, or Mountain Dew, we're going to continue here. So, number one says, what do we call the codify the racial definition of Jews that deprived them of citizenship and fundamental rights? That is called the Nuremberg Laws. In September 1935, the German government enacts the... How do you pronounce this? Nuremberg. Nuremberg laws codifying racial definition of Jew, depriving them of citizenship and fundamental rights. 35, they're already taking the rights away from the Jews. Nuremberg laws. So that's only two words. You have to write it out, so you should be thankful. Number two, um, the Nazis intensified persecution of political descendants and others considered inferiors including Gypsy. So, this is a question. What are the three groups the Nazis wanted to eliminate because they called them inferior? Jews, Gypsies, and Slavs. Okay, so that's your answer for number two. Number two, Jews, Gypsies, and Slavs. And, before we get to the next one, yes, we have a question here about, what about blacks? Go ahead. That is yes. Because I thought the blacks were also. Well, here you guys, my camera shut up. Because I, I thought the blacks were also part of that because we talked about that when it was trying to. Yeah, I think it is too. I don't know. When I was looking it up, I do remember seeing something about that, and I probably should. Now, these are nationalities, um, and blacks would not be necessarily a nationality because, you know, like in this country, we say African American, but some of these guys are from Africa, you know? Um, so I, that's a very good question because I think you're right. I think blacks were considered inferior to, to the Aryan race. Foundation. Yes. Did yes. they Hitler also kill Christians though? Yeah. Yeah, but they only killed Christians because they weren't behind the, the the Nazi movement. Why don't you? Well, that was an interesting question, wasn't it? I thought so. So. The number was different if I said it. All right, so now we're going to ask, what are the two nationalities that make up Slavs? And that is Polish and Czechs. That's right. Some of you in this class are Czech. Some of you full-blooded. You are considered part of the inferior group that they had no trouble. When I was in Poland, um, they said that if the, a German was walking down, a German soldier with a gun, and you didn't step off the sidewalk when he walked by, this was in Poland, because you're an inferior, that the, 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 uh, the officer could take out his gun, shoot you dead right on the street and keep on walking. Okay? So they remember it very clearly, what life was like. And it wasn't much better under communists. So that was the Polish. All right? So, uh, that's number three. Now we're at number four. And we might even be going to the uh, clip. All right. The night of broken glass is the night where the Nazis attacked Jews throughout Germany. The night of broken glass. I do know I asked this question. You two boys, I asked this question. Night of broken glass. That was a night. And there's a whole... I was. There's a lot of uh, articles on the internet about this. The Nazis attacked the Jews throughout Germany, and 30,000 Jews arrested in one night 
91 Jews killed, probably the ones that either rebelled or tried to fight back. 500 shops and businesses looted. So that means if you were you're a Jewish businessman, you were selling color TVs, which they didn't have back then. And then so looting means they broke in there, took away, took out the TVs. Hey, yeah, I got a TV. So what do you call the night when Nazis attacked Jews throughout Germany, arresting, killing, looting Jewish homes and synagogues? Night of broken glass. Night of broken glass. And number five. How many Jews were arrested? 30,000. And how many killed? 91. So they try to do it peacefully, but if you were putting up a fight, yeah, they're going to kill you. All right, so that was number five. Hopefully you got that. It's going to go fast, unless I'm cutting back and forth. Number six, what were prisoners in German concentration camps forced to do? Oh, 500 shops and businesses were looted. More than 1,000 synagogues set on fire. I don't think I have a question there. No, I don't. And the Nazis seized control of Jewish-owned businesses. And this, the Night of Broken Glass in 1938, the persecution of Jews became more organized. This led to exponentially increase in the number of Jews sent to concentration camps. Here we are. So, we might be moving right now to a clip. Life with the Nazi concentration camp was horrible. Hot Prisoners physical. were forced to do hard physical labor and yet given tiny rations. Prisoners slept three or more people per crowded wooden bunk. No mattress like or pillow. Party. So that means you, here's a bunk and they say, well, wait a minute, we have more people in here than we have bunks. That's right, you guys are going to share. Can we okay. Wait, so how close would they be laying to each other? Like You'd be laying either... Like, would it be like me and Cody, like, yeah, sleeping like, like this? Yeah. Oh, stop it. I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so if I did that clip but I wasn't happy with the visual, I want you to answer number seven, which the first part was... Oh. How many slept in one bunk? Three or more. Three plus. And what did the bunk not have? Mattress or pillow. And number eight, what did some of the doctors do with prisoners in the camp? A number of Nazi concentration camps conducted medical experiments on prisoners against their will. So the answer is medical experiment. Oh, and we have a comment over here. Go ahead, Brooke. Thank you. They would they would That's take they twins and they would kill one of the twins like purposely by like giving them like really weird injections. Oh. No, and, go they'd, ahead. and then they, so they kill one because of like whatever they inject them with, and they then they just they keep the other one like, okay, basically. Then they after the other after the one that was injected would die, they'd kill the other one to cut them apart to compare their bodies to see what happened. Oh, that's really sick. How nice. It makes sense though because you're comparing people who are identical and what their results are. But wow, that's you got five bad. minutes. Let's let's go. Okay, let's speed. keep going. Wow, wasn't that crazy? Whoa! Whoa, thank you. Thank you. We're going to keep going now. Um, number nine. What do the Nazis want the prisoners to do in these camps? And they wanted to work and starve them to death. Extermination camps, also known as death camps, were built for the sole purpose of killing large numbers, groups of people quickly and efficiently. Uh, the Nazis built six extermination camps. How many did they build? Six of them. And number 11, what did they tell the Jews they were going to do? They told them that they were going to address, they were going to take a shower. But were they taking a shower? No, they weren't taking a shower. They would put them in there and of course it, they would have this painful death, dying of um, a poison. You had a question over here. Um, didn't they like when they were like when they ran short on the gas? They like use carbon dioxide to kill them. Oh, I never heard that. That makes sense. It's very effective. Just put somebody's yeah. They stuck a there. pipe on a car exhaust and ran. <laughs> yeah, it, it's that's very cheap and very effective. Yes. Like, couldn't they if they just wanted to like like there was a Nazi? Like, I've seen enough of this one dude. So they build a chunk of rock and just threw it at their head. Did they ever do that? Just like beat them. 
Totally yeah, they beat him to death. Beat yeah. Him yeah, yeah, because in all the movies, they showed how, and even in the people's testimonies, which are these movies of brutal, they would say you'd have guards who are just brutal. And they totally get away with it. But then wouldn't there be like super nice guards too? Like, well, they have three men that keep going. There, I'm sure there was. Go All Fritz, which is the one that I'm going to see at World Youth Day when I go there. I will have live pictures from Austritz next year. Okay. Thank you guys. I'm not going there, okay? We gotta move on. Alright, so I'm even lost to where we are. Which one did they do? <laughs> um, number 12. What did they use to kill the Jews in extermination camps? Gas chambers is what they use. And, uh, yeah, put down gas chamber for number 12. Then we're going to number 14. The largest of all of them were ostrich. Largest concentration camp. Efficient. There's actually two parts to it. The other part worked like a factory. The railroad cars, they used to have to march in front of the railroad cars. The railroad cars came right in. They dumped them off right at the showers. Had them take the showers, say, hey, we're going to do that right away. Clean you guys up. Killed them right there. Then they had incinerators where they would take the bodies and throw them um, into an incinerator. And then a lot of these places are considered like cemeteries because there's so many ashes there. And then by the time they're burning the bodies, here comes another train load. And so it was amazing. I got to tell you one story very quickly. There were some, they had regular Jews, the guys that were taking the bodies and throwing them to the, and bringing them to where the fire was. And these guys knew they were going to die, so what they did was they, they wrote kind of diary and notes some of the stories of what happened, sealed them in a jar or something, and buried them in the ground. And sure enough, got by God's grace, they found them. And an interesting story. But anyway, you can, after being there, it, you could, I could go on and on. I got some books about it that I haven't read yet, but it was very interesting. So anyway, that's the one. And how many... The next one, which I don't even think I asked last time, and that was how many might have died there? 1.1 million. It was very efficient. 1.1 million in one place. All right, so we can't stay here. we got to keep moving. And the first one ever built, cool special effect, is in Dachau. Right here, Dachau. Write that in, and it's clear, if it's clear here, we're here now, but we might be having a discussion in the other class. You might be seeing it going back and forth quite a bit. It was 10 miles from Munich. It opened March 20th, 1933. During the Holocaust, it estimated that it's approximately 15,000 labor, death, and concentration camps in the territory. Established March 20th, 1933. Very early. Wow. Remember, he just took office in 1933. And the total number of concentration camps is 15,000. We're just going to call it 15,000, just right there. And although many people refer to all Nazi kids as concentration camps, they were different kinds of camps, uh, extermination camps, uh, concentration camps, labor camps, and prisoner war camps, and transitional camps. And number 16, between 1933 and 1938, who was usually sent to the, to the um, camps? I think that's the next one, broken glass right there. It was political prisoners. Okay, right there, this is number 16, political prisoners. And number 17, you have to write this out. How do they define a political prisoner? This is one of the longer ones you have to write out. People who spoke or acted in some way against Hitler or the Nazis, I could call it Hitler's party because again, it was not he did not call his party the Nazis. Who spoke out, acted in some way against Hitler or the Nazis. <laughs> so we're going to pause it right here. Pause because we're moving on. The video is going to be super long anyway. So I presume you already paused it. And the people in Nazi labeled as asocial. They might put you in there. And do, 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 do. which concentration was the largest of its kind, aka death camp? That's easy. Oh, 
Here's a map of some of them. These are the big ones. These are concentration camps. The extermination camps are the ones with circles around them. These are extermination camps right there. Okay? The other one are called camps where the people from the secret annex were in prison. And concentration camps were the other ones. And then this map is every camp they had. Anytime you're a political prisoner or whatever, it's amazing how many camps they had set up there. And here's a bunch of people, uh, some of the sites you would see when I could stay there. Here's a bunch of kids. You know, I, I got to tell you this one story. They found out that they couldn't get any, they took, they separated the kids from the mothers. Because the kids, they, if they couldn't do any work, they, they just weren't necessary. So what they found out were the, the mothers just didn't care anymore. They weren't getting any work done. So what they decided to do was all young mothers, they didn't even ask them to do any work. They just exterminated them with their kids right away. And so um, they separated the kids and they were exterminated themselves because they just, they, they, they wouldn't do any work. So, it was pretty sad. Um, Auschwitz was the largest of its kind, like I said. 1.1 million prisoners in one plate because it ran like a factory. Okay, so Auschwitz is the largest death camp, bar none. And again, I can tell you stories and stories. In 19, what city in Poland is only 37 miles away? And so, we, we went up there right away because it was so close to where World, um, World Youth Day. It's Krakow, right there. These camps are located probably 37 miles of Krakow near the uh, pre-war German-Polish border. Now, if I just came back from a clip and it's Krakow, I just want you to know that, um, yeah, I do have pictures. And yeah, I still haven't put them on the PowerPoint yet. Anyway, let's keep going. So that's number 19, right there, Krakow. Number 21, did the Times want Americans to know about it? They kept it secret. Uh, the World Jewish Congress didn't even talk about it until 42. In November 42, a press conference was held by the, this Rabbi Wise. Times reported on the 10th page. You know, you want the big stories to be on the front page. But this one they stuck on the 10th page. Oh, by the way, we think there might be extermination camps of Jews. Um, just saying. So I don't think they wanted anybody to know. But this was interesting. It was actually the British. The British. Most Americans were unaware what took place. And uh, there was a conference there. Let's see. International response. Roosevelt created a war refuge board, saved 200,000, 20,000 with Swedish passports. So Roosevelt was able to help get sneak some of them in to keep them from being killed. And then the British bombed the railroad lines to Austrians in 1944. Remember, the war ended in 45. So once they realized what was taking place, they bombed the railroad, which would stop them from going to the camp. Pretty smart if you think about it. So you got to give him credit. So was that what year? It's 1944. That is number 21. 22 were some free prisoners. So when they did, Americans discovered the full extent with the Allied liberation when they marched in and saw the extermination camp with their own eyes. They were shocked what was going on. And the, the Allied forces began to liberate concentration camp prisoners in late spring and early summer of 1945. Many of the freed prisoners were so weak that they couldn't eat or digest the food they were given and died shortly after liberation. So once your body is starving to death and it's eating itself, um, I think now they can do it, put you in intensive care and everything. But back then they couldn't and so they still died they still died. Oh. So, number 22 is yes. Number 23, the Third Reich collapsed in May of 1945. The SS guards fled and many of the concentration camps 
return to displacement prisoners for the camp. Did I ask a question for that? No. 23 says, shortly after the war, how many Jews uh, immigrated to new country of Israel? And that would be 700,000 Jews. You think that's a lot? Even at this time, there are more Jews living in New York than there was in Israel. And Israel just became a new country. Uh, if, if memory serves me correctly, it was before the war ended, or right when the war ended. Approximately 140 Holocaust survivors came to America after 1948, most settled in New York City. You know, you see the difference right there, but there was already Jews living in New York. That's why they went through that connection. So number 24 is 140,000. So hopefully you have these numbers here. I want you to pause it if you need it. And we're moving on. And if you notice, we're not going back and forth because class already ended. So now we're, um, we're on our own here. Many of the Nazis were put on the Nimburg, Nuremberg trials, found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, medical doctors were accused of involvement of horrors of human experimentation. And remember, you, Brooks talked about that. The sobering fact about the Holocaust is how close the Nazis came to total victory. In such countries as Poland, which before World War II still included parts of the Ukraine and Belarus, the Jewish death toll surpassed 90%. So what city were the war trials? That's right here, Nuremberg. And 26, what percentage of the, the European Jewish population got killed? Um, that was Poland, 90%. Uh, even that question is wrong, but you're going to still put 90% for 26, okay? I should just put Poland, 90%. 27 was the total estimated death toll of World War II. And Nuremberg trial, they, uh, yeah, we already have, they're tried in Nuremberg. First time in the International Tribunal of Allies and Nazi occupied countries punished leaders and armies. Current estimate based on Nazi war wrecks official government documents from various countries place the death toll of the Holocaust at anywhere between 10 million and a conservative 26 million. This is not the war, this is just how many people Hitler killed. Because we know there are 6 million Jews. And we know there was another five millions of Czechs, Polish, Gypsies. And then there was other people in there too. So that's 11 million right there. And, um, and so they said it could be up to 26 million. So I don't even agree with that 10 million. I think the bottom line would be the 11 million. And then you would, and you would get definitely up to 15 to 20 million. But don't say 26 million. We're going to go with the high number. 26 million, but that again, that's not the total death toll of everybody being killed. That is the death toll of Germans killing people. So I'm going to have to rewrite that question. All right, so we're going to new. We got new territory here, and it's about oh the doctors. I don't think I have any questions on that. Do I? Uh, 23 German physician administered, tried by the USA. Pseudo-scientific experiments in concentration camp prisoners. Uh, 1947, 16 were guilty, 7 sentenced to death. There it is. <laughs> Pope Pius, the uh. XII, helped the Jews. And so, this was based on an article. I, there's been books on this because there's been some books accusing the Pope of working with Hitler, which is bizarre, but yes, they actually sold copies. And then there's been other books telling how much the Pope did. Um, and so it's, it's kind of gone to rest because the people that wrote the books, it said how much the Pope did, they totally obliterated the other guys. <laughs> so we're going to go with uh, number 28. What is Pius the Twelfth uh, real name, Eugenio Parcellelli. <coughs> Eugenio Parcellelli is his real name. All right, so you're going to write that down. We're going to go to 29 because I really want to turn the page. What is the date that he gave the first anti-Nazi speech? 
That is April 28, 1935. A very powerful speech he gave. Um, oh. Even before the war started, he could see the evils that was being done. <sighs> Uh, speaking to an audience of 250,000 pilgrims in Lourdes, France, the future Pius the uh, Twelve stated that, and what is the date he gave it? How many pilgrims were there? 250,000. Now you're going to turn the page, okay? Turn the page. And so now this says, this is his quote. What did he say to those pilgrims in Lourdes? The Nazis are in reality only miserable uh, plagiarists who dress up old arrows with new tinsel. It does not make any difference whether they flock to the banners of social revolution, whether they are guided by a false concept of the world and of life, or whether they are possessed by the superstition of a race and blood cult. Who said this? Pius the XII. So you used to have to write this down. I was nice to you. All you got to do is put the Pope's name. So because of that, you can pause it if you need it, but it does allow us to go a lot faster. Pause it, and we're on number 31. What one word describes how the Nazis felt about him? Enemy, right there. It was talks like this addition of private remarks and numerous notes of protest that Persili sent to Berlin in his capacity as Vatican Secretary of State that earned a reputation as an enemy of the Nazi party. And number 32, what was Pius the XII worried about? Uh, he was worried about Hitler taking over the church. That was actually Pius the XI. Pius the XII was Secretary of State under Pius XI. And so he was worried the whole time that Hitler would take over the church. So number 32 is a little bit longer, but it's only six words, so you start writing that down. Number 33, so what did Pope Pius the XI sign with Germany to keep the church free? A concordant. Ha! You know, maybe he felt he had no choice, but it was a stupid move. One thing that some of these popes never think about is you don't make... You don't make treaties with lunatic dictators, okay? So on July 20th, 1930, the Vatican jury signed a concordance that allowed German Catholic clergy extra privileges and that the Catholic faith could be taught in the schools. Yeah, they didn't last very long. In exchange, German clergy are not supposed to be so critical to the Nazi party, or at least not so vocal. <laughs> So he says, hey, you keep your priests calm down so they're not slamming us all the time, and we'll work out a deal. So they made the deal, and it was a bad deal. So number 34, in the agreement, who are the clergy not supposed to politically criticize? It actually wasn't called the Nazi Party, was it? No. It was the National Socialist German Workers' Party, okay? Again, this is short, but they oh. never called it that. Number 35, did Hitler keep his side of the agreement? I think we know the answer to that. Uh, what is the answer? There it is. No, he started violating it right away. He did, the ink wasn't dry and he was already abusing it. He had no, no, he, when he's signing the paper, he's probably laughing inside. I know, I don't care, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Alrighty, so what's the exact date that the Pope snuck? Oh, how many notes of protest did he write? They can be asking that 34 separate notes of protest were written. Now, number 36, the exact date he stuck his secret letter there. March 14, 1937, Pius the, the, uh, the, the 12th sent a letter to the German people, stuck it in Germany without the government's knowledge. It was called Mit. Bernander Sorgi with burning word. I think I just have you write the English one. Yes, in English, what is the letter called? Number 37 with burning word. It's underlined. So you write that down. We're not going to waste time on it. How did Hitler react to the, um, 
It charged the regime with repeated violations of Concordia and open attack on the church. How did Hitler... Oh, here's a quote of it, and then we're going to answer that one. None but superficial minds could stumble into concepts of a national god or a national religion or attempt to lock within the frontiers of a single people, within the narrow limits of a single race. God, the creator of the universe, king and legislator of all the nations before the immensity they are as a drop in the bucket. So he's slamming the sense that the Germans are going to be this new super race. And so the question again, I'll repeat again, and that was how did Hitler react to the letter? That was number 38. And that is he was infuriated. Oh. And then the Nazis launched a campaign of propaganda against the church. And number 39, what did time call Hitler? Um, now that in animosity between Nazi and Catholics is very open, there would be no turning back. In the January issue of 1931 Time Magazine, Adolf Hitler was 1938's Man of the Year. There he is, handsome little devil. Adolf Hitler, Man of the Year, 1938. Oh. Okay, so that's the answer for number 39. And number 40 is, isn't it irony that in 37 the Pope criticized the Nazis regime? Hitler then starts a propaganda war in the Catholic Church, and meanwhile in the United States they make him Man of the Year. Pretty bizarre. So, and they criticize the Church. Alright, so that was a yes or no. What is the irony? That's the irony. And so the answer is yes. That's the, oh, you used to have to write it out. Now it's just an, an answer yes, number 40. We're going to go to number 41. What year did Pius the XI die? That's supposed to be XI. Oh, but yet in the last decade, the United States media did criticize the Pope for not stopping Hitler. Anyway, um, I don't have enough time to go into that controversy, but uh, it's pretty much over now. It's pretty big, you know, 20 years ago. Pius IX died in 1939, and Eugenia Pastorelli was elected Pope. And so the year is 1939. Who was elected Pope is this guy right here. And what was his Pope name? And that was Pius XII. So this is number 41. I may, I'm going to hit the button and it may switch. I want you to pause it right now. Pause it and get this written. 42, what did Pope Pius the 12th order when Hitler took over Italy? Uh, through the diplomacy, the Vatican was given, oh, an open city, they could remain neutral. In 1943, when Hitler took over Italy, the Vatican remained neutral. Pius the 12th ordered all churches and other Catholic institutes to shelter the Jews and to ship as many out as possible to escape the gas chambers. Hundreds of thousands of Jews' lives were saved through the efforts of Pope Pius the XII. So number 22, what did he order when Hitler took over Italy? All churches and other institutions to shelter the Jews. You have to write everything that's underlined right here. Okay? So you start writing that down. Pause it if you need to. Number 43 is right here. Hundreds of thousands. This is all documented proof on what they did and how they secretly um, got them out of the country. Super hard, super dangerous, but they did it. Because if you were caught helping a Jew escape the country, you were automatically killed. Okay? So you, you say, I'm going to hide a Jew in my basement. If they catch you, they kill you. So, um, a lot of Catholic institutions risk their lives to help these Jews. And, and at the end of uh, the war, they're very appreciative to the Catholic. Then when the year 2000 comes, then you have a media in the United States who's promoting this concept that the Pope didn't do anything. So it makes a lot of us really upset that uh, they have to change history. And what, who was the most famous Jew to praise the Pope? After the war, Pope Pius XII uh, won the praise of many prominent Jews and Jewish groups 
most famous was the chief rabbi of Rome, Israel Zoli. So impressed with the selfless risk that the Vatican took in helping the Jews, converting to, he became Catholic, is what happened. He was so touched by what the Pope did, he became Catholic. So his, the two blanks are Israel Zoli, and his title is Chief Rabbi of Rome. There's not much room there, so write really small, number 44, second half, is Chief Rabbi of Rome. Write that in right now. Pause it if you need it, because we've got to keep going. It's already too long. And what religion did he convert to? 45? Catholic is what he converted to. And they said, what? You remember we, when um, you can take a new baptismal name. You and I got our name at baptism. We got a different confirmation name. He could have a baptismal name. And he took the baptismal name uh, Eugene. Because the Pope's real name was Eugenio Parcial. Oh. So he even took the name of the Pope. He, he, he was so impressed with what he did. And number 46, was Pius XII viewed as a hero or villain by the Jews after World War II? And the answer is a hero. Bar none. We have tons of statements printed in magazines, books, and newspapers of Jews praising the Pope. And you know, when this was going on around the year 2000, when they were slamming the Pope, there was a Jew, uh, Michael Savage, Jewish guy, um, full-blooded Jew, not a bit of Christianity in him, and he was bashing the people, bashing the Pope. He said, that Pope did more to help Jews than a lot of you other Jews have done. He was chewing out those other Jews who were on the bandwagon saying that the Pope should have done more. So it wasn't that all the Jews in this country and those that hate the church were on this bandwagon. There were Jews more than him that were defending the Pope's reputation. So many so that right now you don't hear about the, the battle anymore because they were silenced by all the pushback they got. <sighs> And in, this is what I was talking about right here. That's when the media really attacked the Pope. And what was, wait, 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 yes. Yeah, so the answer 47 is yes, I just said that. And 48, who tried to warn the German Catholics about Hitler? I said that was yes. And here's a question. Who did Italy use as scapegoat to blame all Jews' problems, all Jews and gypsies? I did not even put that there. And Pius' message to warm German Catholic about Hitler were jammed by German radio. Notice that uh, it is in bold print, Pius XI. So he tried being on the radio. And Pius XII did too. And they jammed the signal. All right? So put that down, number 49. Who tolerated some... Mussolini is the answer for number 49. He tolerated some of the power of the Pope. But why? you got to write this down. It's 49. It's the last long one you have to write down. So you write that down. Because the people of Italy would not stand for his opposition to the Pope. So this is the last long one. This video is way too long. Please, please, please pause this now. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on. Uh, this gives me time to look at it. Number 50, what was the official neutrality of the Vatican able her to do? Right here, up, oh, another long one. Provide war relief and save about 400,000 Jews. So, uh, I would put war relief and save, and just put the number there. 400,000 Jews. Don't, you don't have to write it out, just put 400,000 Jews. Just write the number. And then you can do that. If I would have been thinking, I would have changed this. And I would change it right now, but it's already late. And number 52. Pius XII tried to help Germany by A, sending them money. So, I do not have any questions on that. Uh, what official interest to do? 1949, what would happen to Catholic support of Communist parties? I missed this. 
They would send the money, smuggle a letter into the country to condemn the brainwashing techniques of the Nazis. So you're lucky you didn't get a question on that one. Oh. He was very critical of communism. The Vatican warned in 1949, after the war, that those who supported the Communist Party would be excommunicated. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So we kind of switched to communism really quickly here, but only briefly. They would be excommunicated. So, uh, that probably shouldn't even be in here, but stick it in there. Number 51, excommunicated. Number 50, uh, I guess because we're on pious anyway, we might have to do that. Who said communist, communist, materialistic, and anti-Christian, the communist leaders are enemies of God and of the true religion of the Church of Christ? Those are some pretty politically incorrect words. Who said that? Pope Pius XII. So he fought Germany, war's over, he's right in the face of the communists, okay? I'm sure they did not like him. Number 53, when did China become communist? Again, while we're on communism, especially since we don't have time to really do it, um, the Mayo Test Tong. Test Tong. I hope you know how to pronounce it. He was the one that made China communist. Right here. Please put his name down there. That is number. The when is 1949. The new leader is Mayo. Give me some mayo. Number 54, what did he do to many priests, religious, and lay people? Um, they were imprisoned. And who started the government-run church in China? That would be the same guy, isn't it? Uh, religious schools, Jews were closed, and Catholic movements were banned for alleged counter-revolutionary activities. There he is. He was the one that started the government-run Catholic Church, okay? And then the other church had to go underground. This is a super long video. I'm tired, and so are you. So the very last one that we have is tomorrow. See ya. And by the way, thank you for your applause. Can I make a pan of the room? Yeah, you can make a pan of the room. And no, that is pan. all, folks. Yeah, go, Father. Woo! Yeah. I love this class. No, it's awful. Yeah, go, Father. It's Father. Father, did you have fun? I had fun. Nobody else. Okay.